Good morning. Welcome to the Asheville Road Church of Christ. So good to be together this morning worshiping the Lord from the heart. We hope that uh, this is an uplifting worship service for you. If you're visiting with us, we are so glad that you are here. We hope that you stick around a little while and give us an opportunity to get to know you a little bit better. This month, we are focusing on sowers. That is, we're focusing on evangelism. And we've been talking about concepts related to sowing seed, that is, sowing the Word of God in the hearts of mankind. And this morning, our subject is the hardship, the hardship of planting. Now, maybe you haven't thought about it before, but evangelism can be very difficult. It is very difficult. And maybe you haven't thought about the reasons for it. You just have tried it, and you know that it's hard. Maybe you're very intimidated by it. I uh, wanted to start this morning's lesson by just making three points about why evangelism can be so challenging. Here's the first one. Number one, it requires study. You have to know something in order to teach it. And this is a teaching faith. Paul told Timothy that if he was going to be an evangelist approved by God, he would have to be a worker. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. There is something that people must learn. Jesus said, come unto me all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Matthew chapter 11 verse 29. He said in John 6 45, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. And so there is learning to be done and if you're going to teach then you have to study and you have to know what is to be taught. We have an aversion today to deep thinking. We're in a fast-paced, ADD, easy access information age, and it's just hard to get us to pay attention and to concentrate, even for a few minutes. But it's not hard to learn how to teach somebody how to follow Jesus. You can put the time in to learn how to teach somebody to obey the gospel and be saved. What's more important than that? We learn skills for our job, we go to school, we learn how to pass the tests, we are educated in other ways, we fight our attention deficit disorder for other reasons, why can't we learn how to do evangelism? But it's hard because it requires study. Number two, there's just so many people out there. At last count, there are nearly 8 billion people on this earth. Some of you are old enough to remember a time when the number was half that. Think about during the days when Jesus told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel of the whole creation. He did so probably there were less than a billion people on earth at that time. So now we are here with 8 billion people and it's very intimidating to think about reaching the whole world with the gospel. But remember he didn't say to convert the whole world. He said proclaim the gospel to the whole world. And so you're just responsible for getting the seed out there and letting God take care of the rest. And when you start to get intimidated by the numbers, and you start to feel, this is just impossible, the job of evangelism is just undoable, there's just too many people out there, focus just on the people you know. Because that's what God wants you to focus on. You know enough people in your life to keep you busy with the matter of evangelism. And then if you're successful with them, they will tell other people and those people will tell other people. And we can reach the world that way if we just all work our own individual circles of influence. Maybe you've thought about these first two. It's hard because of the study. It's hard because there's so many people. But here, I think this third reason is the real reason why some of us are scared of evangelism. And we, we're, we're not wanting to plant the seed. And that is because it's controversial. It's controversial. I uh, was watching the news last week, and uh, there's a big, uh, I think it's the G7 summit in Japan. And ahead of that summit, the ambassador to Japan from the United States, Rahm Emanuel, had made some comments about Japanese society and how they need laws like we have in America that ban, uh, ban attitudes, certain attitudes against the LGBT community and how they need to legalize same-sex marriage. And that didn't sit well with a lot of Japanese people. In fact, there was one journalist in Japan who said, many Japanese people are so angry about this obvious, overt, 
interference in domestic affairs. What they are doing is to push LGBTQ ideology to us and it's destroying our culture. Now, I think those are appropriate comments when you're talking about how one democracy talks to another democracy. Because democracies are all about, you know, people having the voice. We vote for our elected officials, we vote for laws, and we take care of our own countries. We don't like other countries coming in telling us how to do our culture. And so, I think that's appropriate. But what, are you, what if you're talking about universal truth? Is it appropriate for us to take a truth about reality into a culture or a group of people that don't believe that truth about reality and say, you're wrong, we're right, here's the answer to all your problems? Well, that's what Jesus is asking us to do. And people don't like it. You're asking them to shift their reality, to accept something that they've never believed before, to turn their world upside down. And Christians today are being accused of being intolerant, they're accused of exceptionalism. Uh, terms are used like cultural terrorism. And they say the same thing the uh, Japanese journalist is saying to Rahm Emanuel. You're destroying cultures. And so it's very controversial to, to evangelize the world. And that reaction is a result of widespread, right, widespread relativism. Relativism is the idea that there's no absolute truth. The truths of the Bible are just one way of looking at things. There are other ways of looking at things. And it's okay to hold contradictory positions in the world. It's okay for there to be two, three, four hundreds of different realities held together all at the same time. That's relativism. And that's the world we're evangelizing in. We take a message that's universal and we say this is the truth, the fundamental truth. And we take it in and people are confronted by that. And some don't like it. There are laws in the world against proselytizing. If you're not familiar with that term, proselytizing, it just means evangelism. Trying to get somebody to change faiths or to develop faith, proselytizing. And there are laws, proselytizing is illegal in 43 countries. And that number is rising and it's somewhat regulated in 27 countries at last count. I have a friend that lives in the United States now. Because where he was an evangelist in Russia, some young people came to his church building and they thought it was the day for worship. And he said, no, this is Saturday. Worship is tomorrow. And then he gave the time. Well, someone found out that he had told those young people that, reported him to the authorities. And if he had not fled to the United States, he'd be in prison because it's illegal to proselytize in Russia. And that's what intimidates us. We're not... In a country, thankfully, right now, where it's illegal to tell somebody about the gospel, but we risk losing friendships, we risk mockery and criticism, people will call you names, they will accuse you of being intolerant, they will accuse you of things like destroying cultures. And so a lot of us are afraid of that kind of thing, afraid to stand up for the truth. But if it is the truth, Nothing's going to change that, and it really matters. Evangelism, despite the hardship, has to be done. That's why I want to look at Psalm 126 this morning. Because in Psalm 26, sowers are encouraged, and they're encouraged by looking at contrast between present hardships and future rewards. And this contrast is done through four separate images. That's the way we're going to outline it today. We're going to look at these four images where these contrasts are given between present hardships and um, future rewards. So let's open our Bibles up to Psalm 126. Let's look at the first contrast. The first contrast is between the present hardship of hope over against the future reward of fulfilled expectation. Hope and expectation. Now, before we get to that, I think we need to answer an interpretive question here because it helps to know the background of this psalm. It's a poem. Poems are not necessarily understandable on face value. I think it helps in this one in particular to understand what is being talked about. When was this? This is a psalm that was probably set 
in the early part of the restoration of the Jews from Babylonian captivity. If you're looking in your Bibles for a historical uh, background to that, look at the first part of the book of Ezra, Ezra chapters 1 through 6. The Jews have been in Babylonian captivity for 70 years. They've been ripped away from their homeland, away from Jerusalem, and a new ruler has released them out of captivity, told them to go home and rebuild their city of Jerusalem and their beloved temple. In the early stages of this, this is probably when this psalm is set. And so they're sowing something. What are they sowing? What they're sowing is, is this, this faith in God, this national identity with God, a covenant relationship, a temple place of worship. And you see a lot of gladness expected from this. In verse 4, they're asking, restore our fortunes, the fortunes they want, and the glory and the joy to be expected is, um, is what could come out of this. So Robert Alter in his commentary points out that you have a lot of shifting in tenses. You have the past tense and the future tense. And all of those are looking towards the future. This is a common thing in the book of Psalms. For example, in verse 1 it says, When the Lord restored past tense the fortunes of Zion, we were past tense like those who dream. But then in verse 4 he says, Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like it hasn't happened yet. And so that's just the poetry of it. We'll get into what that means a little bit later, but for now know that he's talking about hopes of the future, hope in a finished, fulfilled restoration of the Jews in the city of Jerusalem. So with that background in mind, let's look at this first contrast between the present hardship of hope and, and the future reward of fulfilled expectation. First of all, look at the hope here, verse 1. He says, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. The hope is expressed in the idea of a dream. And we talk about hopes as dreams all the time, but dreams can mean all kinds of things. What kind of a dream? What is the sense of dreaming here? It could be several things. It could be an illusion a silly idea not based in reality. Maybe you share a dream and ambition with somebody and they say to you, okay, keep dreaming, dream on. You know, that's one way it could be looked at. A second way could be wishful thinking for something that ideally would be the case but sadly probably will never take place. And we, we might say, we might talk about a dream home or a dream vacation. That's wishful thinking. But a third idea behind a dream is hope in the midst of great trials. Like the type of dreaming that Martin Luther King Jr. talked about in his memorable speech during the Civil Rights Movement when he said he had a dream that his children would one day live in a nation when they will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character. And I think that's the type of dreaming that's going on right now. A dream for the ideal, a dream that can happen with the help of God, a dream that should be. It's hope in the midst of great suffering and trials. Here the Jews have this hope through the prophecies of people like Isaiah and Jeremiah. They start to see it coming into fulfillment. They're moving back to Jerusalem, back home. It's a hope in the midst of great hardship. Now over against that you have the expectation of fulfillment in the future. Look at verse 1 again. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion. When he restored them. Remember what I said about the tenses. Don't put too much stock in the fact that he's talking about past tense because verse 4 makes it clear their fortunes have not yet been restored. This is the poetry speaking here. And part of it is, he's talking about something that has been promised, and since it's been promised by God, it is absolutely certain it's going to happen. He doesn't say, if one day we pray, if one day this will happen. He says, when the Lord will restore the fortunes of Zion. This is going to happen in the future. 
And when it does, it will be a time for great rejoicing. Verse 2 says, Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. So do you get the contrast here? In this first image, you have the contrast of a dream, which is hope, hope that is in the midst of great trials, over against expectation that will certainly be fulfilled. And each of these contrasts is going to give us an application about evangelism. Here's the first one. First of all, evangelism will work. It seems like an impossible dream that the Word of God can change somebody's reality, that the Word of God can actually make somebody who doesn't believe that there's any life after death, doesn't believe there's any hope and forgiveness from sin, can actually turn that person around so that they become righteous and have the hope of heaven? That seems like a dream, but the Bible tells us that God's Word, the seed, is that powerful that it can have that kind of effect on people's lives. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so this is a dream that can be fulfilled. That should be encouraging. Evangelism will work. Okay, let's look at the second contrast. The second contrast in Psalm 126 is between culture and the church. Let's look at the contrast. In verse 2, you have the nations mentioned. Now, this word, nations, often refers to a political kingdom, Egypt, Babylon, Assyria, Israel. But here, it's used in the plural just to refer to the Gentiles, non-Jews, non-believers, maybe pagans, if you want to look at it that way. It would be equivalent to our word culture or world as we use it today, people outside the covenant family of God. And as we look at culture, it is often more times than not, antagonistic to God's covenant people. In Psalm 2, for example, the psalmist talks about the nations. And look how they're cast. Psalm 2, verses 1 and 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel again, together against the Lord and against His anointing. Nations rage against the Lord and against His anointed. Over in the New Testament, the nations of the world is discussed in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, where John says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. For everything that is in the world, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life, is not of the Father but is of the world. And the world is passing away with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. The world is antagonistic to Christ's cause. And so Christ, he calls for a countercultural movement. He said to his people in John 15, 19, if you are of the world, the world would love you as its own, but you are not of the world because I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So this is the nations, a culture that is antagonistic to the people of God. Now over against that, you have the church, represented by Zion, verse 1. Zion is the name of the city of Jerusalem, but it's used here to refer to the covenant people of God. And throughout this psalm, you have pronouns like we, our, us. These are God's people. The modern day equivalent to this, of course, is the church. And for some reason, God has not pulled the church out away from the world. But we have a lot of trials and tribulation today because God has asked us to live in amongst the nations, amongst culture, in culture. We're countercultural within the culture. Uh, for example, in John 17, Jesus' prayer, verses 14 and 15, he says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. But then he says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. So not of the world, but in the world. That's our situation. And that's the way God wants to keep it. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 
Paul is dealing with sin in the church. There's a man in the church who's guilty of unrepented sexual immorality. He's bold and prideful. He will not repent of that sin. And so Paul tells the church at Corinth, I want you to withdraw from that man. I don't you want you to associate with the sexually immoral. And then he stops himself in verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 5. He says this, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of the world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. Now why does he want to keep us in the world? I think the, the explanation for that is obvious because he wants to bring the lost to Jesus. He wants the church to stay pure, but that doesn't mean we go live in caves and separate from everybody and not associate with anybody who doesn't know Jesus. No, we're supposed to be connecting and making relationships with them without destroying our own purity so that we can teach them the gospel, so that they can have the hope of salvation. We're not of the world, but we're in the world. You see the contrast? It's between culture and the church, between the nations and Zion. Now something strange happens, something unexpected in the psalm. Look at verses 2 and 3. At the, end of the verse, at the end of verse 2, it says, Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. Now, this isn't Christians or isn't God's people who are saying this. The nations are saying, The Lord has done great things for them. And then in verse 3, he goes on to say, The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Did you ever expect to see that? Culture and the church are saying the same thing. Both parties are saying, the Lord has done great things for us. The Lord has done great things. Both are worshiping God. What's the evangelistic application? Number two, here's the second application. Evangelism will be vindicated. Jesus is coming back. And now we're in tribulation. Now we suffer mockery and rejection. We're called intolerant. But one day Jesus is returning. And that's when everyone, sinner, saint, culture, church, nations, Zion, everyone will sing, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 and following. Therefore God has highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Those that have been ridiculed, mocked, shamed, called unloving and judgmental should take comfort, because when Jesus returns, everyone will recognize the same truth. They should take comfort from passages like Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, which says, Behold, He is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see Him, even those who pierced Him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail, other translations say mourn, on account of Him. The nations one day will agree with the church. Maybe not now, but someday evangelism will be vindicated. Here's the third contrast. Psalm 126, the third contrast is between dry beds and flowing streams. Let's look at the, the contrast. Dry beds is not mentioned specifically, but we know that's what they're talking about in the Negeb. The Negeb was an arid wilderness where there were a lot of these wadis or dry river beds that most of the year were empty, no water in them. Areas were very arid and dry, desert places. But when the rainy season came, they'd be filled with streams of water. And this represents the heart that doesn't have God. The heart without God is dry and it is hopeless. You see, we know, even if nobody's ever come and told us about Jesus, without ever hearing the gospel, we know something's wrong. Right? We know that. Something's missing in our lives. And if nobody comes and tells us what to do about it, we try to fill that hole in us 
with all kinds of worldly pursuits. We stammer around, we, we stagger and grope in the darkness for solutions. Solomon talks about this in the book of Ecclesiastes. And every pursuit he tries that is not God, he says, it is vanity. That word means empty. It's like a dry riverbed. It's how the heart is. There are so many examples of this from pop culture. I, I see them all the time. And a few weeks ago, I, I saw this interview with Matt Damon. And they were talking to him about winning the Oscar for a best original screenplay in his movie Goodwill Hunting when he was only 27 years of age. And he said something that was very interesting when I was reading that interview. He said about receiving the Oscar, he said, imagine chasing that, chasing the Oscar, and not getting it. And getting it finally in your 80s or your 90s with all of life behind you and realizing what an unbelievable waste of your life. He said, it can't fill you up. If that's a hole that you have that won't fill it, he said, my heart broke. I imagined another one of me not getting that award until I was an old man and going, where did my life go? What I have done? What have I done? And then it's over. What he's saying is this, I received this as a young man and it was a blessing because I realized young enough to do something about it that this wasn't what life was all about. And I don't know what he's tried to fill that hole with since. For, unfortunately, I don't think it's been Christ. But he knows it's not the Oscar because when he tried it, it was like Solomon in all of his pursuits. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. This thing that I thought would fulfill me this thing that I've sacrificed everything for, I got it, and I still feel empty. I still feel the same. Something's lacking. Tennis champion Hannah Man Mandlikova was asked how she felt about defeating great players like Martina Navratilova and Chris Everett Lloyd. And she said, any big win means that all the suffering, practicing, and traveling are worth it. She said, I feel like I own the world. But then the interviewer asked her another question. The interviewer said, how long does that feeling last? And she said, about two minutes. You see, that's how it goes. You get what you thought you always wanted, what would fulfill you, what would refresh those dry riverbeds of your heart, and it's empty, vain, and worthless. It's not what life is all about. Without God, we are without hope. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. Over against the dry beds in the psalm, we have flowing streams. Look at verse 4. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. You've seen those nature shows where the rains bring life again to these arid regions. The grounds crack, there are no animals around, no green vegetation and then there's a sudden monsoon, and all of a sudden there are animals everywhere. The ground is saturated. There's life, greenery everywhere. That's the picture of the heart. Restore to us our fortunes. The word restore means bring us back to our original condition. You see, God never intended for us to go dry. He never intended for our hearts to get in these conditions we put them in. He wants them to be full we turn to sin, we turn away from what makes us whole, what makes us good, what makes us happy, and we find ourselves hollow and emptied out, and we can't get back to the position we're supposed to be in without God. So here's the application. I think this one's pretty obvious. Evangelism will restore and refresh lost souls. That's why the gospel is called good news. The only remedy for mankind is Jesus. Jesus is the only one that can fix a broken heart. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, verse 6. We've got one last contrast here. The contrast between sowing and reaping. Let's look at it. First of all, the sowing. This is in verses 5 and 6. And sowing is described as something done in tears. He says, weeping is bearing the seed for sowing. 
sowing in tears, sowing while weeping, bearing your seed. Now, those of you who planted gardens this year, you probably didn't weep and wail as you were doing that, but you might have hurt your back. You might have gotten really dirty. You might have gotten a little frustrated, a little hot, a little dehydrated. There is hardship in planting. That's the idea here. We've been talking about that a little bit with regard to evangelism. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6 says, The hard-working farmer is the one who ought to have the first share of the crops. Farmers work hard. Think about all they have to do. Last week we talked about cultivating the soil. The soil has to be right in order to receive the seed. Then the planting of the seeds, the watering, the weeding, the waiting. We talked about the parable in Mark chapter 4, verse 27, the parable of the seed as it's growing. The farmer plants the seed and then he has this waiting. Sometimes the waiting is the hardest part. You know, working with somebody, trying to bring them to Christ, you want it to happen just like that. Don't you wish it could be like a light switch, you just flip it on, and all of a sudden there's light in somebody's soul, but that's not the way it works. It takes a lot of prayer, a lot of patience, a lot of waiting, a lot of trusting. What did it mean to the original readers of this psalm, the exiles returning from Babylon? It meant travel. I think it's about a four-month journey for them from Babylonia to Jerusalem. It meant travel. It meant repenting, building. If you know Ezra and Nehemiah, you know when they started building the temple and the city walls, they had this intense opposition. People were threatening their lives. They didn't want the Jews to be back in Judea. There was a lot of weeping with the sowing. Today, the church in evangelism, what does it mean? Well, it means study. It means going. It means persuading, praying, waiting, teaching. It means being patient. It means being rejected and mocked sometimes. Being treated like the scourge of society. Being called names. There's hardship in planting. In the introduction, we talked about some of that. We know what the tears mean. We know what the weeping means when it comes to sowing. But there is reaping. Look at the contrast. Verses 5 and 6 again. They reap with shouts of joy. So they sow in tears, and they reap with shouts of joy. And they shall come home, the psalm says, with shouts of joy bringing his sheaves with him. The conversion of a seed to plant, the transition of a sinner to a saint, is a great image for how God changes our sorrow into joy. In John 16, Jesus talks about this in verse 20. He says, you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. And then he uses another image. We've been looking at the imagery of sowing and reaping as a sorrow turned to joy, the pain of planting turned into the joy of harvest. Jesus uses another imagery that is easy to understand, especially for our mothers here, and that is childbirth. In verse 21 he says, When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. You might, be, you might think sorrow's too light a word for that. She has pain, right? Torture. Sorrow because her hour has come. The labor has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So what's our application? We look at this contrast, this final image, and it is this, that evangelism will prove to be rewarding. It may be painful now, but in the end it will prove to be rewarding. Both now and then. Now it will be rewarding. Proverbs 11 verse 30 says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. What do you want? Do you want a life that's empty and worthless and selfish? 
and just based on things that you can't take with you? Or do you want the tree of life? He who wins souls is wise. Here and now, in the present time, and then, of course, then, in eternal life, even more joy. Paul thinks of this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, when he's anticipating the return of Jesus Christ. And he asks this question, what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? He says, is it not you? You are our glory and joy. He knows that the people he brought to Christ will, will be there in eternal life. And that drives him, that motivates him. He looks forward to that reunion. We will see one another again. We will recognize one another and we will remember the bonds that began here that continue in eternal life. Evangelism will prove to be rewarding. As I bring this to a close, I want you to think about this. If it's not hard, you're not doing it right. If it's not hard, you're not doing it right. Planting is difficult. And folks, if you're a Christian, you should be planting something. There's seed to be sown among your kids, among your co-workers, your neighbors. You're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world, but it's not easy. You may encounter hardship, mockery, and ridicule and think, this is a sign that something is off. No, it's, it's, it's showing that you're doing it right. Look, if it's not hard, you're not doing it right. It's got to be hard. It's going to be challenging. But if it is, know this. Evangelism is worth it. And in the end, it'll prove to be worthwhile. In the words of the psalmist, those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. Do you want that joy in your life? God wants you to have that joy. He sent His Son to die for you so that it could be yours. Do you want it starting today? Are you ready to obey the gospel? To be baptized into Christ? To walk in newness of life? To live faithfully with God? Do you need help along the way? Can we pray with you? Can we do something for you? We're going to sing an invitation song. If we can help you in any way, let us do so right now as we stand together and as we sing.